Hello and welcome to the Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum. I'm Neshka Pfeiffer, Sachs Museum curator and your host and moderator for the Grafting the Grape online program series, which is sponsored in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Today's presentation, Climate Change in Art, is a moderated discussion with contemporary artists Lorraine Walsh and Leigh Han, and we'll begin shortly. This is the sixth and final presentation in the Grafting the Grape series, and we're so glad to have you join us. These presentations highlight content from the current exhibition at the Sachs Museum, Grafting the Grape, American Grapevine Rootstock in Missouri and the World, which is now open to the public at the garden. We're able to offer accessibility features, including ASL interpretation for the deaf and hard of hearing and live captioning, which you can access via the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To turn that off or for more options, click on that closed captioning feature. A note about today's webinar, it'll run approximately one hour. The presentation will last approximately 40 minutes with time at the end for a Q&A session. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A function in the box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll sort through your questions and get to as many of them as possible by the end of the presentation. Today's program will be recorded and posted on the Missouri Botanical Gardens YouTube channel in the coming weeks. I'm joining you from the Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum, which I'd like to acknowledge is on the ancestral and occupied land of the Chickasaw Nation, Eleni Tribe, Iowa Tribe, Kickapoo Tribe, Osage Nation, Oto Missouri Tribe, and the Quapaw Nation. We acknowledge the ongoing relationships these nations have with this land and urge non-Native people to educate themselves about this history and about the contemporary work of tribal sovereignty within these nations. Through this acknowledgement, we honor the elders and their descendants of these indigenous nations in order to bring visibility to these long silenced histories while working toward a more just and equitable future. Our speakers today will discuss their multifaceted artwork installations for Gra the Grafting the Grape exhibition and how they investigated the impacts of global climate change upon native Missouri grape species. Lorraine Walsh is the art director and curator of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics and visiting associate professor of art at Stony Brook University. She oversees the Simon's Art Center and Science Program and is the executive director of SCGP News, the center's biannual newsletter. As an interdisciplinary new media artist and curator with a lifelong passion for discovery at the nexus of art and science, Lorraine's research in sci art is located in the rich possibilities of the interplay, shared structure, and aesthetic expression intrinsic in natural and creative processes. Her work is exhibited internationally, and she's the re recipient of numerous grants and fellowships. And Lei Han is an artist, educator, and designer. Her work, often inspired by nature and everyday life, explores notions of perception, memory, transience, and time. And fascinated by the influence of Eastern philosophy in Western art, especially in modern and contemporary art, her recent work aims for creating the cohesion between spirituality and creativity, as well as making new connections between the artist, viewer, and the object and subject. Lay's current work in experimental video, animation, interactive art and installation has been exhibited at galleries, museums, and film festivals nationally and internationally. Lane Lorraine, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Netska. Um, thank so, you for the introduction. Yeah, my pleasure. And th thank you so much. And thank you so much for creating the beautiful art for those of you who can see my little window um, there. One of their sculptures is right behind me this evening. So um, I'm glad we're going to actually be able to talk about that shortly. Um, and I'm going to kick this uh, discussion, our moderated discussion off. I'm going to just stop sharing my screen for a moment so you two can be prominent. Um, Lorraine, this is actually the second time we've worked together um, in a previous exhibition that I had curated at another museum on skateboarding art and culture. You had created 
and shared mesmerizing visualizations of skateboarding sounds that became an important part of how visitors experienced that show as well as that aspect of skateboarding culture. I knew that you often featured the natural world in your work too, and I was hopeful I, I would get to curate another project where your artistic vision uh, could be expressed again. And here enters the Grafting the Grape exhibition. When I reached out to you to think about creating work for this exhibition, what was it about the subject that attracted you to the project? And how did you come to include Lay in the partnership? Well, first, I was delighted to be invited again and to have the opportunity to work with you again. Um, I so enjoyed uh, working with you with the skateboard project. And I was really excited about the opportunity to, um, to show at the Missouri Botanical Garden and to explore grapes and the grapevine with Dr. Allison Miller and you know, learn about her research and to uh, you know, explore the grapes and how um, climate change may be a part of, possibly a part of um, Dr. Miller's research. I have a long history of working with nature as well as science. And in those projects, I've collaborated a lot with Lay. And recently we collaborated on two projects uh, with uh, flora and fauna. One was um, uh, Forest of Manifolds, which also included animation, prints, and drawings. And the other one was Plortus, which is about John Cage, but specifically about his um, mushroom, love, love for mushrooms. So that also featured plants. And I just find endless possibilities of expression in plant life. Hence, I was very excited to, to be a part of this exhibit and then to invite Lei, with whom I've worked with closely for years. That's so great. I'm so glad this worked out <laughs> so beautifully. Um, and Lei, uh, what was it about the exhibition project then that drew you to it? And how did the extension of like planning the artworks, thanks to the calendar delay of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, affect what you and Lorraine ended up creating for the exhibition? Yeah, well, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, kind of uh, talk about how Lorraine and I work on this project together. So Lorraine and I have known each other for years and we were colleagues for almost a decade at UNC Asheville prior to um, her, new, her current assignment at Stony Brook University. And we also are friends for over almost 20 years. And so it's a long lasting friendship and collaboration. And when Lorraine approached me with some project ideas and almost, I almost always say yes <laughs> to, to begin with. And just because I trust her artistic vision and her work ethic, as well as I think that we are just a really great team. We have really great working dynamic and we trust each other. On, on projects and on directions. Um, so I'm also, I also heard a lot from Lorraine about you, great things about you and how wonderful a curator you are and about the Missouri Botanical Garden and the museum. So I got really intrigued of, um, and very excited of creating this project with Lorraine. Although my work um, for the most part focus on everyday life and nature. I have never really worked specifically with plan and particularly with scientists. So this opportunity really widened some of my area that allow me to explore new territories, which is super, super excited to me. And as far as how the delay um, of COVID-19 affect our project, um, I think for the best part, it all played out <laughs> perfectly <laughs> just because I think that COVID-19 has pretty much destroyed all our plans. Um, Lorraine and I were going to get together, uh, physically work together because that's how we used to work in the same space. And, um, but because of COVID, we have been working remotely and remote working is great. We are able to bounce back uh, ideas from each other, but um, it, it's not the same as it is in person. So um, as soon as we both got vaccinated in March and we kind of just came together 
in my house here in Alexander and started to develop the project in more depth. Um, but we have took a lot of planning prior to that and have a lot of concepts and ideas in place. Um, and it all worked out the timing wise beautifully as well because it's a springtime and I happen to have two of the great plants in my backyard and they're ready for the new cycle of the year. And so um, they were planted by my uncle from Oregon in 2015, he put them in there in my backyard. So they were just perfect for this project. So we were able to capture this whole um, growing and development progress with the grapevine. And uh, that kind of became the foundation and inspiration for many of the pieces that we're creating for the show. Yes, and we really benefited from a bounty of works. Um, there are uh, three different video pieces, a sculpture as well as prints that uh, Lorraine and Lake created that are on site here at the um, Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum. So the first, what I'm going to do now is actually share my screen again, and we're just going to look at the um, the sculpture, the first sculpture, uh, the first artwork, I mean, there we go. So this is called The In-Between, um, everyone who's joining us this evening. Uh, and it is a kind of a stylized wine uh, trellis made from wood and then has these two um, very delicately laser engraved um, rows of plexiglass panes um, in which the upper row features scion, that's the grape vine that is to be grafted, and the lower uh, line of plexi panes features drawings of rootstock. And um, an important part of the story that uh, developed as a result of the history of the develop of an innovation of the exhibition that we're focusing on includes um, the necessity of having to graft European wine grapes onto Missouri rootstock. And we actually had not really looked at um, uh, the wine grapes per se in terms of like growing them because we, we do grow them here at the garden. We have them in the Kemper Center for uh, the, which is our center for home gardening. Um, and, and so th this is a very tall sculpture. It's about, uh, it's over maybe six feet tall and um, it's really delicate and light and captures the light really well in the museum space. So uh, Leigh, I'm gonna ask you first, how did you come to create this sculpture? Yeah, um, well, this sculpture was inspired by the grafting technique and uh, Lorraine and I first had the concept of a floating form in the space. We want this form to be ephemeral. And initially we have thought about using material such as uh, 3D printing, but due to COVID, the accessibility of both the facility as well as material has been really, really challenging. However, that posed another exciting material um, use for us, which is the plastic glass. And that has been the material widely available during COVID and as well as, um, you know, the most uh, affordable and accessible. And so we thought that this, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to utilize this transparency of the plastic glass. And so the project itself Lorraine can tell you more about the structures and the ideas that come to place. Um, but I think from my standpoint, the drawings are so beautiful and ephemeral. It is the best way to represent these drawings, use these kind of translucent and engraving technique. So that's how we decided end up using the technique that we used. Beautiful, thank you. And so Lorraine, how did you go about yeah, pull, making the images and drawings and, and pulling the sculpture together? Um, well, with the drawings, it's, it's drawing is something I've um, been increasingly doing the past five, six years. And it's something that um, I have found that uh, it's, it's not really to represent something. And when I start to draw, I actually don't plan each line, one line, goes down to my drawing and then the next line follows it and the next line follows it. And for these drawings, um, it uh, 
took quite a while to to get the feel of what I, I wanted with the with the science and, and the roots. And fortunately, as, as Lei mentioned, uh, she uh, we found that this, this treasure in her backyard um, with the grapevines because we were planning to go to St. Louis and I was planning actually to go visit vineyards in New York and those plans were, were you know, ended because of COVID. So um, a lot of the, uh, the, the science are inspired by uh, Lay's macro photography. And then the roots, I mean, it's, it's from a lot of research, looking at a lot of roots, looking at a lot of um, grapevines, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But the magic of having Lay's um, photography, she's taken hundreds of photographs, is that uh, they, I, I, not mistakes happen, but the unexpected happens. And so because of that, you know, the unexpected that happens, you know, with the camera, um, then you take another step with the drawing and then it, I, I find it becomes something unto itself. And we went through so many ideas uh, with the different forms this would take. And originally we were going to laser engrave, which neither of us had done, and print them and then ink it, ink the plate and print it. But it's so wonderful and exciting with collaborations is that you discover so much, almost like Ule and I were talking about it the other day. It's art is so much, artists are, and scientists have so much in common where they're in the process because they, we don't know the end result often. You know, we have these ideas and these theories, just like a science has theories. And like Lay and I had all these ideas, but we didn't know. Neither of us had ever done laser engraving. So, it, and it's this great curiosity, I always say, in art and science that drives the individuals to explore, discover. And so once we got the plates and I was, you know, experimenting with inking and then, you know, I was FedExing the plates to Lay and, you know, we bought back and forth. I'm in New York, she's in North Carolina. And we decided, wait, this is it. We don't, we don't have to do anything. So we just stopped and decided these are the plates. This is the art. And, um, and then we went about designing the trellis, which also took many, many different forms. But um, both of us, I think, uh, were pleased with, as Lay mentioned, the ephemerality of it, because we were also layered in the many ideas we were exploring during the show was climate change. And so uh, the ephemeral nature of how these hang in the space uh, also uh, complements what's happening in the world today with climate change and, and ephemerality. But it was a great experiment. We, it was really interesting to work this way and it was great to make a sculpture again. And it was, it was so nice because uh, for, like there, there's so many elements to seeing a live plant outdoors in the garden. But of course at the museum, I'm not encouraging live plants mm -hmm. inside. And for you to capture um, kind of the crux of the, uh, the challenge, like of the innovation of grafting and also mm -hmm. the, in, the, the, in, the materials that you were using. So the fact that it's this light and kind of airy and, and beautiful in the space as well. Um, and, and kind of, and, and embodying the message of the show too, I thought was just so beautifully and so succinctly done too. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing again, and I'm going to pick up, we're going to look at our, at um, A Degree Warmer, which is one of the films. And I'm wondering, actually, um, would you both like to describe it a little bit before I ask you questions about it once we get, I get this up on the screen here? Lay, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So we took um, the title took inspiration of some recent scientific data mm -hmm. regarding the average temperature rise since the pre-industry period. And it's roughly about two degrees warmer than um, the early um, 1860s. So um, we, we were very much exploring the idea of climate change in plant life and on Earth. Um, but we using a animation that is sort of later interpretation of the stories. And um, as you can see on the screen, there are representation of um, the area of Google Earth uh, surface. And there's also 
the structure of the roots, and behind there are、um, movement that representing the formation of the cell. So it is kind of a transformation from a macro to a microscopic level, and、um, understanding how climate change is associating with every fabric of our life and every fabric of plant life is something that we're trying to、um, install in this project. So, and it's also it's a. It's, so it's a combination of many, many images of, from Google Earth, and, and in particular rivers.、Um, Lay collected those, and、um, so it goes because we were, were talking about our, you know, many, 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 we had many ideas, but you know, we were looking at rivers, and you know, over the course of time, and how obviously they're changing so much. And、uh, we also used a.、Um, so as Lay mentioned, it goes from the. Uh, the macro to the micro, and、um, it also we explored、um, color palettes as、um, a, an aesthetic for describing climate change, and we've collected a lot of real, real data on climate change, and you know all the all of those colorful bar charts and different wonderful、um, uh, infor informational、um, visuals right now、um, show. You know the, the, the all these color changes. You know from these,、uh, you know these these blues and purples. You know going into these reds. So we also use that just as a tool to further strengthen our our idea. Yeah, and the animation is really a process of creating it because it involves of thousands of imageries that were collected from various of different sources. We、um, had all these. Overhead Google Earth images from the NASA Earth Observatory, and、uh, also a lot of historical、uh, imagery that from the Berkshire Community College Bioscience Image Library, and、um, so those imagery are、uh, really study of how plant cells,、um, you know, how plant cells learn to、um, heal. Over time, after grafting, so many of them is a representation of how grafting and the connecting of the tissues and the you know vascular channels affect in the、um, the the way that the cellular level developed. So these very subtle background movements, they are they're not makeup imageries, but they're scientific data that were animated using. Um, what we we call in our field machine learning, and we actually use something. It's called a style game, and、um, it's a generative adversary network system, where this network, when you import thousands of images as data, it started to go through this data and try to generate、um, artificial images. The images doesn't exist. So in some ways, this animation is creating new forms that doesn't really exist. So none of the things that you are seeing in these layer of movements were actually real images. They're all artificial imageries, and、um, the root system itself was created with 3D animation application. So that's rendered in 3D,、um, and we also use. Grape scans from Dr. Allison Miller's research lab, which is really, really fantastic、um, piece of resource for our work. And, and that was something. That, yeah, obviously, we were only showing our, the, our audience a, a couple of minutes of clip, but in fact, the the film itself is several minutes long. And so, at some point, you sort of see these beautiful bunches of grapes visualize. And so, I was curious how they that sort of came out. That, but again, you were tying all of these threads of the story together.、Um, and how?、Um, Was there something specific about any of the climate change research that you'd been reading that was like integral to how you shape the narrative of the film? I think we are looking. Yeah, go ahead, Lorraine. <laughs> well, it, it really it's the film is a poetic、um, response to climate change, and so it's、uh, you know as Lay described all of the you know.、Uh, 
all of the, the, the machine learning images, all of the thousands of images that we use and all of the, um, the Google NASA images we use, you know, when someone looks at the animation, they don't, may not see it at first, but it's all embedded in the film. And so I think it's just, it was a broad look at um, climate change in, on, in the globe and how, um, you know, from, from the industrialization of, of the world, and, you know, during the 1800s, how that has led to um, climate change and two degrees warmer. So, and then also just, um, you know, we, we looked at, uh, you know, different studies with fossil fuels and how that's affecting the environment and carbon emissions. And so it was all of these uh, journal reports that we, we read and skimmed through um, to inspire the um, animation, but it's not one, I wouldn't say it's one specific point mm -hmm. climate change. What do you say? Like, do you, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And also the images from the Google Earth, they don't really go beyond the 1980s, I believe. And so they are fairly new imageries. And I think that what we are looking at is uh, instead of uh, numbers and data, we are looking at this connectivity between the imageries uh, that from a microscopic level to a micro level, which um, we weren't really giving any suggestion to the audience either in this animation, whether climate change is a thing bad or good, or whether um, we have to provoke something, but it's more like a fact. These are the imageries connects, they transforms. What do we, I mean, what do we learn if based on the machine learning, they tell us something that's predictable future um, because there's data points that we can associate with to predict what happened down the road. So I think that these, these imageries themselves um, might provide a um, source of inspiration for people who have concerns of, science, uh, of climate change, but not necessarily that we want to determine the form itself and how people interpret the, the piece itself. Well, and I think also like the data that you're getting is something systemic. So it's not like, yeah, you're, it's not like climate change specifically. So I appreciate your, your clarification of that. Thank you so much. And um, before we uh, move to the next film, would you like to, uh, since, unfortunately, we did, since we didn't, uh, I was a little loud and didn't have a, um, you couldn't really listen to the composition. Would you like to explain a little bit about the, the composer who created the, the sound for the film? Yeah, so um, I have invited my friend, Ben Richter, who I met over a residency in Finland to be the composer of this particular piece. And he just finishing his uh, doctor's degree over Cal Art. So this piece is actually modified based on one of his pieces that he presented at his recital for Cal Art. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I am going to share the next film. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with you, Lorraine, um, since uh, our viewers can watch this. What species of grapevine did you focus on in this series, um, and how are the elements combined in this short film, which we call Cycles? Well, I was using um, the Missouri, the native Missouri uh, Vitus astavalis was the inspiration, and uh, we also were considering um, the Vitus riparia, the river grape as well. And uh, this, although it became, I believe, rather generic, but what I was really fascinated about were their, among many things, uh, were their root systems. And after studying a lot of different images of root systems is how they, they spread out. As you can see, they don't go down, but different species have different root systems um, as well. But I, um, was fascinated in particular by that root system um, because of its um, uh, its flowing nature and just in interesting texture or, or or lines like for drawing. You know, it just interested me. You know, for, as a drawing, the way it just would reach out. And then the um, scions um, they were from mostly actually from just a, the summer grape that. Uh, courtesy of Lay's uncle. 
because we were able to get such wonderful photog photographs from them that um, showed forms that I don't think we would have otherwise have seen these, these certain rings and whatnot and uh, certain deformities or things that may not be captured otherwise. And Lai and I have worked before like this in other pieces. We have uh, I've taken my drawings and made them move, which I love to do. And it's sort of um, I, like I'm one of the animations pluritus, it's sort of an anti-animation almost. And this is moving a little quicker, but in some of the collaborative animations we've done, it moves so slow that you can barely um, see sometimes the motion. So these we decided um, using the word cycles so as uh, cycling uh, climate change and cycling through the planet. Um, and, the, and also we, we used color again to, um, uh, to, uh, as a tool for climate change. And then in the background, it's and very subtly, there's, there are images from Google Earth. Right, and for our audience, um, these the drawings that you see that are animated are um, also the ones that were in the sculpture too. So you right. see them the, these these images almost kind of like symbol, symbols in a way, kind of repeating in the series that you create. Um, so Lay also was there something different in the way that uh, you like the mechanics of how you pulled this together that was different because this film looks very different from the other three that are in the, the other two that are in the exhibition. Yeah, um, I think like Lorraine was saying, I really love these drawings and I wanted to honor the drawings and also give them a different feel than the sculptural form because on the sculptural, they're suspended, this is just a moment, uh, a moment of movement and maybe separate separation and connection, um, just very abstract way. And I think that in this particular piece, uh, we were really thinking about how Dr. Allison Miller's research, um, part of her research is really trying to study the roots and the science and to develop drought resistant roots in order to fight climate change. So in that nature, that when we put this piece together, um, we were looking at a lot of riverbank imageries from Google Earth, and we're trying to create a, a, a sort of abstract interpretation of what happened if the, ban the river bank started to pe this appears and, and uh, maybe they ch transform or they move from one part of earth to another part of the earth. How does that gonna impact grafting in general? And so these floating pieces of drawings is the representation of the grafting under the condition of climate change. You know, one thing that we found really fascinating with grafting, and that's something I had did not know about, just there were very little, you know, and that I learned, you know, we learned that it's an ancient technique is that it's especially important we learn for um, urban environments like St. Louis. And, you know, we, which, um, because there's, there's so much sort of data on how urban environments, because there is plants and trees, are really susceptible to climate change. And, you know, even the, the, the events of this summer show how, um, you know, with the terrible flooding that happened, especially, you know, in the cities and whatnot, that um, it's really very destructive. So even something, you know, like what Dr. Allison Miller, and she spoke about it in her um, talk a little bit about, I think how in California, there are labs that are um, doing a lot of research on drought resistant wood. So we, we found that really, I, we really found that fascinating and tried to weave that into our ideas. Oh, that's great. Well, and there's so, um, there's just so many levels of complexity to everything that you're doing. I'm, I'm going to pull up the first image here. Um, there are a couple of series of prints that you've also created for the exhibition. Um, like I said, this the bounty runneth over. Like all of these beautiful works um, are all on display at the Stax Museum for Grafting the Grape. Um, this is one of the prints that's a part of the Vitus series. So Vitus is the genus of um, for the grape vines that we've been speaking about this whole series. So V-I-T-I-S. Um, there's a beautiful green one here, and there's um, sort of a, another darker vine with um, red 
kind of overtones uh, for that's Vitus number two. So, um, and either of you can answer this or together, how did you create these images and um, what were the characteristics about grapevines that you kind of found important to capture in these works? Lorraine, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, this is a, a true collaboration. And, you know, we were, as we were working, everything was, ideas were feeding other ideas. And so this um, is a combination of some of the macro photography that Lei um, took um, in her, uh, you know, at home. And, um, and then also it's the machine learning prints that we both explored. Um, and we're still actually pushing that idea and working on some new prints. Probably this winter we'll be doing that. And then some of the lines, the drawings, they began picking up the, um, uh, the scions that you see in the, um, in, the, in the sculpture and then adding some, you know, just some lines at the very end to sort of pull it all together. And uh, the color was highly, not highly manipulated, but manipulated to show here some unearthly purple color that looks like it's been damaged perhaps by the sun and it's kind of needs some, you know, it's parched and whatnot. So in the machine learning images were really interesting in that they subtly but created these um, images, you know, we've never seen before as the machine learns and, you know, to, from its own algorithms, how to create the images. And we would work, collaborate, and it was, constant like zoom and back and forth and both of us um, uh, just sharing ideas and what about this and what about that and that was really uh, rewarding to do that as well and the same with the animations it was very much a you know uh, I find that the wonderful thing about collaborating with Lei is that well we work great together but you know there's a synergy but but with the critiquing part is always um, what well, one one person doesn't think the other one does, and but you know vice versa, we fill it in. So it's it's a really rewarding to um, collaborate because you discover things uh, you know that you otherwise wouldn't. I think mm -hmm. and these are archival digital prints as well, and uh, yeah. the colors are just so beautiful and rich. So yeah, sorry, Leigh, please go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Yeah, I just want to say that. Um, I always admire Lorraine's instinct on things <laughs> after all these years of collaboration because I gave her thousands of imageries, okay? <laughs> it's thousands of imageries and she just knew exactly which one to take it out of it. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was pretty impressed by how she filtered all these information uh -huh. and know exactly what to process into the artwork. And I think that for the audience that doesn't know, this process took taking all the macro photos, it took almost two months. So it started out with early spring when the grape, um, the grapevine are, is still a, sort of half asleep and um, and goes all the way until the day, the week that we went to <laughs> St. Louis to install our mm -hmm. show. So there's a ongoing process both are um, with single photographs, micro, micro photographs was taken every day um, with hundreds and hundreds of imageries, as well as with a tripod uh, mount camera taking time lapse of every day. So the, it was recorded pretty much this whole process of uh, growth and development. And actually, if it's all right with you both, I'll move to that, um, the Bud Burst series. And so we've got four um, prints. Now I'm just going to do them in succession, like I have been, um, that they're they're hanging as a series of a quartet in, in the gallery where they're displayed and installed at the Sachs Museum. So I'm going to scroll through them, but you can see, you can also see them behind Lorraine and Leigh and their um, avatars there. Um, so it, I just still, um, I feel like this, project was so perfect because Lei, you were growing grapevines in your home. And so you could capture 
these exquisite macro images and also the, these beautiful colors and this, you know, to see the hair on the vine, on the leaves and everything, like you get um, kind of a little bit about the anatomy of the plant as well as all of these other, um, you know, interesting things that you were also doing with the images. Uh, so how did this series come about, if you don't mind uh, telling us, um, telling our audience? Well, when, when Lei was showing me the, the photos, we were exploring different ways of printing and we were focusing on machine learning a lot. And then when, when I began to see the macro photography, I said, this is it. These are gorgeous. We should, this is, this is it. And so, um, and that's it just, the, what she captured was just exquisite. And there was some color correction and liberties taken, but, um, but the, it just captures the growth and like, the, the joy in, in the plant. So that yeah. it just, when seeing them, it was just obvious that um, I felt like we needed to celebrate the imagery. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, having, having decided that we will go with the most simplistic way possible and keeping or giving the full um, representation of these forms. And it's kind of shameful to say that over all these years, the grapevine in my backyard, I've never really taken a notice of them up until this project. <laughs> not so, shameful, not shameful. It just finally blossomed for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did. But I think, I think even the last few um, years and life gets so busy and you don't really get to enjoy this, but with both the project in mind as well as quarantine, that definitely provide you a lot of opportunity to associate with life forms that near you around your house. So I think that's something that really we really want to celebrate is the life um, of the plants. One thing that I really love about this series, too, is that how close you get to the plants, you know, because sometimes these things are very, very small when you're actually looking at a live grapevine. So to have this benefit of of seeing as up close as you were able to capture with the with the camera is just exquisite. And then you still see these beautiful motifs, you know, that are um, a part of all of the other works tying all of these series together. Yeah, and then I think what's really beautiful about these grape Grape plant itself is that the, the bud burst is always this beautiful, like a baby looking so fresh leaves coming out from this very rough surface of this old stems. And it's a really great contrast between kind of life and death forms. Right, exactly. Uh, right, so the last thing I wanna do here is um, we're gonna see these bud bursts kind of again in a moment. Um, I'm going to bring up the next film, the last film, the last film we're going to talk about. Does everybody see that? It's the homage to Arthur Clark Pillsbury. Um, and would you like me to explain briefly who Arthur Clark Pillsbury was before mm -hmm. you tell us about the film? Okay. So, um, the museum has had a very long and storied history here at the garden. It was actually built in 1859, but pretty much stopped functioning as a museum in the early 1900s. In the 1920s, a gentleman named Arthur Clark Pillsbury, who worked for the National Park Service, came and set, uh, set up a residence in the museum in the basement floor, our lower level gallery, to shoot time-lapse film of blooming flowers. And he did that for, um, you know, a year or so. And so we have some information on the garden blog about this series. And I had shared this background because it happens to be a part of um, kind of a seminal part to the museum's history. And lo and behold, um, this beautiful film, um, the homage to Arthur Clark Pillsbury was created by Leigh and Lorraine. So please tell us more about how you decided to do this. You know, when I found out, if, you know, who he was and, and the whole history of um, Arthur Pillsbury is really fascinating. And he was um, a great uh, nature photographer and he, he did the first time lapse of a flower, not the first time lapse ever, but the first time lapse of a flower at the museum. And so um, Lay and I decided um, this would be such a great project and homage to this 
um, photographer and also to take advantage of the machine learning that we had learned. And so um, Lay set up a, um, a you know, time-lapse booth in our home and uh, captured um, so many images and then also ran them through some style GANs. And so it's a combination, I'm gonna let Lay explain more, but it's a combination of the, the, the buds and the style GANs and the machine learning. Um, so I, we also felt that it was sort of interesting because um, machine learning is kind of almost a, a different kind of time lapse in, in and of itself, mm -hmm. um, where it has what's called, a, it, it, it has a back propagation, where it's always looking back, backwards for, for, for information to create the next um, image. And uh, so it's, it's a wonderful, um, you know, I thought it was a nice, wonderful, not only homage to Pillsbury, but also using a new technique, just as Pillsbury did that we were using a brand new technique in, in mm -hmm. animation. And I, I'll let Lei please yeah. explain. Sure. Thank you. I think, I think this idea has probably arrived the first out of all the, yes. the other projects because Lauren and I were watching a documentary on the remodeling of the museum and we discovered the story of uh, Pillsbury. And we are really fascinated by it because it really make us feel like this center is associated with creativity since the start. And having a show in here just really honors so much of uh, us as artists. So I think that um, we almost immediately decide that this will be for sure, one of the projects. Okay. In, yeah. In, yeah, in terms of the progress, it all kind of just evolved uh, also naturally because I've, I've been taking so many photographs and it just kind of the next step to um, sort through those photographs and um, make sure to run them through the machine learning and see if there's any interesting connectivity between the imageries that kind of evolving this whole process of the growth of the grapevine. And, and um, while doing this, and we wanted to do kind of both ways and to show people what a machine sees the growth of this plant and what us humans sees. And as a contrast, they put next to each other side by side to give the audience a illusion as if maybe you wanted to question why is the earlier image look so weird? And um, maybe that's just something kind of interesting for, pe for people to uh, you know, process in, in their experience. Well, and that's also, I think that's the other element about this film that I also find really like, like the, the, the footage that everyone's watching right now is that it's, it is something unique and different that wasn't necessarily captured by film. It's the, the machine learning is a part of the film as well. And so you're seeing things that you would not see in real life. Um, I really love the, how the infinity symbol kind of ends the, the film and sort of showing kind of the the longevity and kind of the renewal of grapevines too in a in, in a symbolic way as well i think um so thank yeah was, thank you so much um for creating these and i'm going to stop sharing this as well um and so i guess what i would like to do is just sort of potentially to just wrap up some of the ideas that you had because you've shared so many levels of complexity about the plants and your interest and the way that you used this different technology to interweave all of these aspects. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that I, I would love to know too, is if what was that, what was the most surprising thing to you? Because you both are, you know, like you said, you participate almost like scientists in your artwork, you're, you're experimenting and you're theorizing. What was the most surprising thing to you about grapevines and, and grafting um, that you, that you felt that you was really kind of unusual to you and, and was meaningful to you? That's a really good question, Nashka. <laughs> I try, I try to do that. <laughs> so I, I'll try first, Lorraine, if you don't mind. Yeah, so to me, this is a whole new experience for me. Um, my, uh, my, most of my work don't do with time lapse. And um, I do a lot of experiment, experimental video and experimental animations. And I use a lot of computers in my, in my work. 
So this is really the first time I kind of dedicated to a plan for two months <laughs> of my life. <laughs> and um, that really makes a difference because you started to realize how this decoration around your house is not decoration anymore. They are, they're, they're you know, they're beings and they, are, they have life and they silently transforms. And so I think that's probably the most surprising thing to me is that I even feel like because all the attention that I'm paying to this grape vein in my backyard, we have so much grapes this year. It's like a full two trees of covered with grapes and they're delicious. <laughs> so I think that's the most surprising element that all my care toward the plants pay off. <laughs> Hmm. That's so great. I love it. That's a wonderful way to wrap that up. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Lorraine? Um, well, I, I really love learning about um, the grafting and also about learning um, about uh, how scientists today uh, are working at the cellular level and the different um, uh, equipment that labs like Dr. Allison Miller's are using, which are just incredible. And I was thinking about um, botanical, you know, illustration and, and just botanics, horticultural in general, you know, we artists and scientists have a lot of in common because we observe. And it's fascinating that we've learned so much like in the 1800s from, I think it was Hubert and other great, you know, you know, great il illustrators. And so it was, it was a, a visual learning how are the leaves shaped? What are they doing? What are they doing during a different season? But now, thanks to scientists like Alison Miller, they're getting, they go right into the root. They go right into the, into the cell. And there's actually a lot of math because I tried reading some of these journals and they were very, very difficult. Um, so that was one aspect that I, I really love um, learning about. And then technically I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a printmaker and I draw and I also animate and I've used sound, but the past several years, I really have gone back to drawing a lot and not because of my schedule. So it allows, that's something I can do. And yes, giving almost two or three months of my life to that was, was something that um, like Leigh did, did. But I really enjoyed exploring um, the machine learning, which I still want to learn more about, and the laser um, uh, engraving, which I had never done before. So I, and then it was just wonderful to work with Lay and to, to see how our different skill sets complement each other and take it to a new level. And that's so true. Uh, and, uh, and then I guess finally, it was so delightful to be at the Missouri Botanical Gardens installing in May, because it was the first time I think I was really in nature <laughs> in months because of COVID. So it was, it was like magic just walking through the gardens with Leigh, you know, when, you know, taking breaks from our installation at the museum. So it's another thing is, yeah, you have to be close to nature to be human. It just is an important, a you know, very important aspect of our lives. And just very grateful for the opportunity. Both of us really are grateful to Netska for the invitation. Yeah. Well, I'm so, I'm so glad to have you. I mean, this, um, this whole uh, exhibition was very, uh, I mean, it's got this amazing garden history to it. You know, one of our earliest botanical advisors was involved with helping figure out these innovations. And, um, but to know that this ancient plant, I mean, humans have actually been working with grapevines for thousands of years, uh, to know that they're still like so carefully tended for the future. And they're also, um, yeah, they are delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they really are. I mean, regardless of whether or not you're, you know, making wine out of it, I know that um, around, in, you know, because these grapes, a lot of these native grapes, you know, um, are here in Missouri, people have, you know, yards overgrown with them. And so they'll, they'll make jam or jelly or whatever mm -hmm. from the grapes, um, because they're able to harvest them. Uh, and so it, in this, there's a such immediate, like, even if you get away a little bit from the science of it, it's just sort of that sensory exam, the experience of what they're like and looking at them and, and tasting them and enjoying them that way too. Um, and they've, people have been enjoying them literally for thousands of years, which is such a, an incredible human legacy. Um, I think some people might 
think that the grafting the grape, you know, if they don't like wine, the exhibition itself might not have anything for them. But grapes, in fact, have been enjoyed by humans or, you know, hominids for mm -hmm. many thousands of years because they're really, they're wonderful. They're delicious. They're, they're this wonderful sensory experience. And um, that ties us to these wonderful plants too, regardless of whether or not you drink wine um, and we'll continue to, you know, there's just such an important, they're an important aspect of um, obviously the wine industry, but just at, within, you know, the, the, the Vitaceae family that the grapevines belong to are, you know, pretty long lived and widespread around the world. So people enjoy them you know, regardless of where they live, uh, or, you know, regardless of the United States, they live all, they're all over the place. And I think we are getting close to our hour. So um, uh, is there, if I'm, I don't know if there's anything else you two would like to share, but it's been an absolute delight to work with you, but also to have you here with us this evening um, to sign out this phenomenal series in such a beautiful, impactful way. So thank you both for being here. And if, yeah, if there's anything else you'd like to add, just let it, let me know. Okay, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and I also want to just uh, thank Lorraine for getting me on board with this uh -huh, project. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because otherwise I would not have a, such a great journey with both of uh -huh. you. And uh, it's really an amazing experience being in Missouri, as well as seeing the real site. And um, the scale is very different, though, <laughs> from the picture and uh -huh. <laughs> the real site. And we really enjoy everything. Um, yeah, yeah, you're such a ho good host, Nashka, hosting us uh, in those couple of days that we are doing the installation. And um, yeah, I, I think that um, I'm just really grateful to be part of this. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. And uh, yes, one of our uh, viewers said, thank you. This was fascinating. So oh, okay. I'm just so pleased that we were able to get you this evening to do this because, um, you know, I it's really a charmed life when you're the curator organizing these things because I get to have these conversations. I mean, how many meetings yeah. did we have? Zoom meetings, you know, through the course right. of developing yeah. this and such a really amazing conversations and and then to and, you know get to really see you pull this together and the conversation that you have and so I'm looking forward to being able to um you know we'll be sharing this recording as I mentioned but there'll be a future blog post on the gardens blog about you know all the artists work and focusing on um more of what um you shared with us this evening and another one of our viewers said thank you for this fascinating conversation and show pieces I love the insight about ephemerality as a response to climate change so Thank you. Well, and thank you everyone for joining us and sticking with the series. If you've been to all of them, though, like I said, the recordings will be up um, soon. And thanks to the Missouri Humanities Council for funding this project. And thanks to our accessibility providers for making this possible for to spread the word in, uh, to as many people as possible. Um, I hope everyone, thank you both for being here. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.